one of the things that really inspired me is when I heard CC Winings on an interview last year. She said that I'm older now and I am currently under the instruction of a singer, mentor, and coach. So here we are, Dell Award winner, <laughs> Grammy Award winner that has recognized yeah. he needs a singing coach. And she said this in front of all the world, I've been singing wrong for years. I gotta have some help in learning the proper technique so I can have the strength I need to do this live recording. For her to admit that, I heard that and I said, that's what every singer needs to realize. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Inspire with Carrie. And I'm so excited about our guest. She is piano pianist, excuse me, and master teacher of music, Miss Janice Howard. And I'm super excited because we're gonna talk about some of the things she's doing. I'm gonna ask her, um, questions about music and all of that. So if you're someone who wants to get into the music industry, or even if you're just singing on the praise team or anything like that, I would suggest you tune into this episode, share this with anyone who um, wants to be a singer or wants to get into music, because I think um, I think this will really benefit them and I think it'll really bless them. So, and we're also gonna talk about her book, which I've read and which is pretty fabulous. And I'm super, super excited to get into that. So before we get into your book, Breathe and Sing, A Handbook for Singing Success, I'm gonna kind of go ahead and kind of start at the beginning. I'm curious, how did you get into music? Cause I know you started at a young age. I did, I did. My mom put me in piano lessons at the age of 10 but in church as well. So my home, um, back at home in Chesney, South Carolina, there was the Gas the Baptist Church. And back in that time, there was the whole um, Bible school and um, summer school and all of that going on. And my mom had me in piano lessons for a while before then, just a, just a little while, but it was during vacation Bible school where it really took off. and. Pastor C.D. Montgomery um, saw something in me and he asked me to start playing piano for vacation Bible school. And at that time I was only reading music. I had been taking long enough to be able to um, successfully read hymnals. Um, so I began to read the hymnals and the first hymn I ever played was Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus <laughs> in Vacation Bible School. And then at that time, God had placed it on his heart to take over the cost of my piano lessons. And from that time forward, Pastor C.D. Montgomery and that church paid my piano lessons every single month because he saw something in me that we didn't see. Of course, my mom saw it, but I didn't at that time. Um, I just knew I was going to piano lessons and I loved it. <laughs> you know, so that's where it basically started um, from reading music and having that, um, that uh, environment of actually learning music and the foundations of music and learning how to actually read and understand music. That's what that and did the passion start then too? Because I know you said you liked it, but was it was it one of those things where did you really want to start at that age? Or was it one of those things where once you started, you fell in love with it? Or were you kind of like, oh, I got to take piano lessons? <laughs> and you yeah. kind of fell in love. Well, I actually loved piano. I loved going to piano. I was in the band and I did cheerleading for a while. But of course, when I got ready to go to um, high school, I left cheerleading and went completely to music. So at the beginning, I loved music. I think the passion was naturally there. Yeah. And I really authentically did have a love for it. Of course, that grew when the um, aspect of the anointing came in on it, which was um, a few years later in 1983. And I remember it like it was yesterday. In 1983, um, the church has changed. The church changed hands, and a new pastor, and a Pentecostal pastor from Anderson, South Carolina, and that church never knew of a Pentecostal pastor before. So oh, he came yeah, things he came in with the Holy Spirit, yeah, sanctification, um, speaking in tongues, right, and <laughs> hands, and right. all of those things, and turned the city upside down. And yeah, <laughs> and I was there. 
And it was on Easter Sunday. Yes. Where, um, in 1983, where he anointed my hands to play and everything turned. Wow. Um, everything went to a next level. Wow. And from there, I uh, began to actually play in church under the tutelage of the minister of music that was there. And shortly after that, um, at I believe I was 16 when I became minister of music of that church. And I was there for 20 years and probably over 20 years. I left in 2000 when I relocated to Columbia. Wow. Wow. I love that. I, I'm curious, um, did you have any artists that you looked up to like when you were younger or that were influences or was that just you just knew what you wanted to do and... Yeah, I didn't have any influences. Yeah. I just knew that I loved classical. I loved reading music. Yes. I loved, I had the joy of reading music and understanding the complexities of music. Right. Um, I loved gospel. Um, at that time, choirs were really big. Yeah. And so I, I loved um gospel music and choirs. Now, if you were to ask me, well, there's some favorite choirs, yeah. then, then yes, at that time, we, we I really loved Milton Bronson and mm -hmm. the Thompson yeah. Singers. At that time, they had brought out I'm, I'm Available to You, one of my favorites. And so, so things of that nature, uh, uh, great influences. On the classical side, of course, there's just... Um, um, the basic classical that everybody hears, the Mozarts and the yeah. Beethoven and, and the concertos, um, that they, things of that nature, not necessarily influenced by them, the people, but the music that they wrote and the fact that I right. love the challenge of reading yes. that music and then executing yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Wow. I, I'm curious, you were 16 when you were in such a high leadership position. Did you have... Um, trouble even relating with peers and stuff because, you know, this is something you're super, Absolutely. super focused on. And kids are just, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. The the kids at my age in my church had a very hard time. Yeah. <laughs> I can think about this now. They had a very hard time with me. They would be mean on purpose simply because of where I was yeah. in, in church and now understand it was the position which I was in. And so there was a lot of jealousy. There was a lot of envy. And, um, and, but I, I'm grateful because my mom was also the director. So <laughs> <laughs> right. she was the director. So we worked together all the time. We were yes. together all the time. So it wasn't a whole lot that could get to me, but, um, that, that I did have trouble with peers growing up. Um, I was kind of like an island, mm. um, yeah. And even at school, I, I was different. Mm -hmm. And um, so didn't really get involved in a lot of mess. I, uh, everybody else was going to clubs and the, 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 the responsibilities of being minister of music kept me away from all of that. Right. So I didn't have time to go to clubs. I didn't have time to hang out on the street. I didn't have right. time to get pregnant. I didn't have time to right. uh, do this. So I wasn't involved in none of that. And so because of that, I was kind of you know, set apart. And I guess today, now that I'm mature, I would call that consecrated and being sanctified for the purpose. Yeah. I, I love that you share that because I think that will encourage anybody who's watching young people who maybe they have something that um, they're super passionate about and they kind of feel a little bit isolated and just are just different or awkward and, and they're feeling like they don't fit in with their peers. I think it's a good reminder that's just a small portion of your life. Mm -hmm. Like when it's all said and done, I mean, I'm 33. I'm not thinking about, oh, I right. wish I fit in more when I was 15. Who, I mean, who cares? So I think you can help people who are watching and even adults who maybe they're just in a season of their life where they're kind of zoned in on what God's called them to do and they've had to maybe make a separation. I think what you're saying could really, really encourage them. Well, I want to kind of get into your book real quick. And I had some questions. I read the book, first of all, I think it's a, a, an excellent book. But also, I think even if you're not like a singer, because I'm not really trying to be putting out an album or anything, but I liked it because I just think there are principles just about the discipline aspect. So even if you're not trying to be a singer or anything like that, I think it's just, you know, something to encourage you to, to, uh, to have good technique, discipline in everything you do. But I'm curious, what, what inspired you to write this book? Well, uh, for me, this book is 
a natural progression of my years of teaching. So this was actually a, a natural progression. And so with the other courses that I'll be um, that I'm working on currently, right. all of these it, is very natural. It's a natural flow for this season um, from the previous years of putting in so many hours um, preach um, teaching. And I want to say preaching, but <laughs> uh, so many hours teaching, yeah. and actually being a musician myself and teaching so many. Um, this was very natural. And that's, and so the inspiration actually came from the previous years of my whole life. I mean, I've been doing music since 12, you know. Uh, I've been in the church serving in music since 12. That's a long time. And so this was very natural. And, and, and when I first learned of the gift to actually teach and communicate it, um, that that's another level that changed things for me. Um, I realized that I had that gift in college. And, um, and so that became a very natural progression in the teaching arena of music. Yeah, because I was going to ask you about that, because so many people, um, they're great musicians, but they may not be able to take on a leadership position where they lead people and teach people. And I'm sure that takes a special calling and temperament and, and um, yeah, yeah. It's not the same. No. It, 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 it's not one size fit all and yeah. it's not the same. So being a great musician don't necessarily make you equipped to teach and mm. communicate it to where others um, are able to execute it and grab it even at young ages, yeah. like that three, four, and five. That's yes. a gift, you know. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and it has nothing to do with your ability to play. Right. It just means that um, you may not be able to communicate what you're doing to mm -hmm. others so it's effective to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I wanted to ask you about that. Um, do you think just anybody can sing and, and play music if they really want to, but they maybe they don't have the talent to? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Is there a point where they where someone should maybe say, you know, um, I'm taking the lessons, I'm singing, but maybe I shouldn't do this? Or do you think anyone can do it? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Well, that depends on their motives. That yeah. depends on where they see themselves. Mm -hmm. it, it, it depends on how they perceive what they're doing and where they want to go with that. Right. Um, for example, I've taught many people, adults including, that didn't necessarily have a gift to play or to sing, but they wanted to learn because they had so much passion. Now, does that mean they need to go on American Idol? No. Um, does that mean they need to have a solo in, in the praise team or the choir? No. But I really do appreciate that because I've taught people that may not could hold really a good tune, but they want it to be better in the choir. They want it to be better on the praise team. They they recognize that God deserved an excellence. Yeah. So something extra to go that way. So it, it really depends on the person and what mm. they and what they want to do with it. Mm. You know, my biggest desire with breathe and sing. It's not to take the place of the gift that anyone has. Mm. It is just to fuel that gift right. with excellence. And for them to recognize that, um, you know, it, even in the body of Christ, you, we, we sometimes have difficulty realizing that we should do everything we can to honor God with what we're doing. That's right. If that means learning how to breathe correctly, yes. so it has nothing to do with your gift. Yes, you're anointed. Yes, you're graced. Yes. We can do something a little more excellently yes. for God. Because we can do it for the world. Right. We do all kinds of things to make ourselves better for the world. Right. We do. We have so many mentors and coaches in position making a lot of money because yes. we want to what? be better. So that's what Big Sing is all about. It's just about someone taking this and becoming better. And if you want to use that for a professional arena, so be it. If you want to use it to be a better praiser or worshiper on the praise team and choir, so be it. It's there for you for that foundation to make you better at whatever level you are. Yeah. And, I, and I'm curious also, you know, even if you don't even want to be a singer or anything like that, 
even with taking musical lessons, isn't that just even good just for your brain and just discipline in general, even for young children, even if they're like, I don't really want to be going to this. It's just a way to stretch your mind a little bit to learn more. And it is is because um, not just breathe and sing. Yeah. (laughs) Music in general. Yeah. Even if you don't want a lot of these kids don't go to college in music. Right. You know, they're, they're taking music lessons. They're taking they're doing singing. They're doing piano. They're doing drums. They're doing guitars. They're doing all of these things. But that's a part of enriching their lives in the season that they're in. Yeah. And music is just one of those effective ways to progress the person. You may not even major in music in college. You right. may get the college and never touch a piano again. Right. But you have the enrichment of it. And scientific studies have proven mm-hmm. that the engagement in private, there's that there's a different study about private mm-hmm. piano lessons. It does something different than a group piano lesson, which I don't favor at all. But a private piano lessons does engage the brain, um, especially at young ages and the exposure to classical music and all of its complexities. It has a brain connection. It has a physical connection, an emotional connection, a mental connection of growth and development um, on every single level for every single person at every single age. And we know that because even as adults, we can listen to certain music and our feelings change, our emotions change based on what we're listening to. So even as adults, we have the effects of music. Yeah, this is true. This is true. I'm curious. You said um, you said something earlier that you're not really a fan of like group piano lessons. I didn't even know that was a thing. I always thought it was only private. Can you expound mm-hmm. upon why you're not a fan of that? I've never even heard of I don't even know how you do that. Yes, but piano? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm not a fan of group piano lessons because group piano lessons does not award the instructor to give individual attention to the individual. In group piano lessons, you're dealing with a group. And when every single person is not on the same learning curve. Yes. They, they don't understand everything the same way. Yeah. Um, one person may get um, time signatures very quickly and yeah. another person may take two or three lessons to get time signatures. So if we're in a group environment, what are we going to do? Right. Somebody be lost. Somebody's going to be left behind, you know, and, and, and number two, it also takes away from the student yeah. from building their own individual ear um, because it, 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 music is, is, it's all about hearing and yeah. developing that hearing. And it, it takes an individual to hear what you're doing, your right. own self, you know? And, and I know group lessons use headphones for that. And, and there's some advantages for group lessons, but also those two reasons, I am not a big fan, um, simply because um, I'm a very engaging yes. teacher. And I know. I can, <laughs> yeah, yes. and I can engage individual students the yeah. way they should be engaged as a group and to me I'm I'm I'm, I'm not giving them the service right uh, and awarding them the service that they came yeah to yeah and so I'm just very particular about that you know and yeah. the individual attention yeah I like that um in your book breathe and sing a handbook for seeing success um you talk about a microsystem approach could you kind hmm. of Get into that a little bit or expand upon that? Yes, yes, yes. So music is huge. Mm. It has very many complex moving parts. And for some people, it can be very overwhelming Mm. to take these big components and try to learn them. You know, so um, I found that through my teaching years that breaking those big components down into very bite-sized micro uh, uh, um, digestible portions is easier for students. And I've been able to execute that and see it work for years as most of my teaching years um, have been with preschoolers, elementary school age to age grade five. And so I've been doing this for years. And so I know it works. And that's why I say this is again a natural progression because I've been doing this for years. And and teaching elementary age school and t- preschoolers um, 
it's easier for them to grasp when it's bite size. Yeah. You know, because these things are really big, you know, and um, preschoolers, it's kind of hard for them to understand um, counting music, but when you break it down to something bite sized that they can digest, then all of a sudden they understand one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. And, you know, and they begin to connect it with what they're learning in the classroom. Yeah. So, as, but for adults, it's the same thing because as adults that want to learn music, there are big components. But when you break it down with anything in life, if you can break it down to digestible micro portions, it's very easy for your digestive system, so to speak, yeah. <laughs> to be able to digest um, those concepts. Yeah. Who's easier to teach children? Are adults children? Yeah, I bet. Little children. <laughs> it's kind of hard to untrain adults, huh? <laughs> well, right. you know, scientifically, if you look at that, then it's proven. Mm. Um, in certain age groups, children are sponges. Yes, <laughs> they're able to sponge up and soak in what mm -hmm. you present. So that's why I'm very particular about how you present music, and I don't babyfy. Yeah. Preschool. That's because good. they're sponges and they can handle what you give them. Yes, if they you can. Teach, my, my, one of my teaching philosophies is if you teach it, they'll learn it. Yeah. So because they're at that age where their brains are absolutely absorbing every little thing, you know, so they can learn those concepts. If you present it, they'll learn it. In the book, you talk about, you know, proper technique and all that stuff when it comes to singing. And I often wonder... You know how sometimes you have people who are like skinny, even though they eat like the worst food and they don't take care of themselves, but somehow they just like, are like that. Are there singers like that who don't do any proper technique, but who can still manage it? Or will it eventually catch up to you if you don't yes. do, use proper technique? Yes. Singers, there are millions, probably thousands upon millions of singers that's singing like that right now. Yes. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're singing like that. They are anointed. They are grace. They are gifted. But you'll notice that at a certain age, um, even when you're singing, you, you you may feel like, oh, I'm out of breath. Or, oh, I can't reach that note. Oh, that was a struggle. Well, that's because you're not using proper technique. Yes. One of the things that really inspired me is when I heard CC Winings on an interview last year. She said this, she said that I'm older now and I am currently under the instruction of a singer, mentor and coach. So here we are, we have a Stella Award winner, Grammy <laughs> Award winner that has recognized yeah. she needs a singing coach. And she said this in front of all the world, I've been singing wrong for years. Mm. And now that I'm at this age and I'm doing this live CD, yeah. this live recording, I got to have some help. Yeah. And learning the proper technique so I can have the strength I need to do this live recording, which is that's the first one she's ever done. Yeah. Real, But for her to admit that, I heard that and I said, bingo. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> that's what every singer needs to realize earlier. And not later. Yeah, but it's an absolute foundational truth. You can sing all day, you know, and be very successful, bring the house down, fill up seats, sell tickets, you know, and sound absolutely amazing. But at some point, um, you're going to notice, hmm, I probably could have done that better. Why can't I? Yeah. I, I have a question because I've always heard this is kind of not random, but it's something I've always wondered. Is it true that if you're like a bigger woman, or I guess I'm speaking from perspective of a woman, um, if you're a bigger woman and you have this like bellowing voice, this large voice, is it true that once you lose weight, you'll lose some of that? Is that a thing or that shouldn't impact you? It is That's not. Like a, that's just kind it of like a little a thing. myth. <laughs> yeah. That weight doesn't. Now I'm curious about, we know about technique. Are there certain even lifestyle choices that will impact your voice? Like alcohol or even types of foods that you eat, will that eventually wear in your voice over time? It is. It does every day, just like anything else in life. Got it. 
what we eat, what we drink, our lifestyle habits, how we take care of ourselves, how we don't take care of ourselves. All those things affect. I remember one time I was up in the praise team singing and I was heavier than what I am now. And I was like, Hmm, I'm out of breath. Okay, but that's not just because of poor technique. That's also because I was too big. Yeah, you know, I was out of shape. <laughs> so that does affect your singing because yes. <laughs> breathing sing brings out the point of how the proper way to breathe, but all of that is affected by the quality of your health yes. as well. Yes. You know, so if you have poor lung, um, poor airways or poor, and you're having sinus issues because of what you're mm -hmm. eating, you're mm -hmm. allergic to stuff, and you can't breathe, and you got sinuses going mm -hmm. on, and all that has to be cleared yes, up. It and does. we're drinking the wrong thing yeah. before you sing, you're eating the wrong thing, that you got high blood pressure, you got low blood pressure, you got high insulin, you got low insulin, all of those things. Uh, will affect you just like it affects anything else. Singing is no different. It is absolutely no different. I love that you said that because I recently had a weight loss journey and I was telling my mom, I was like, oh my gosh, just life is so much easier. Like little things you take for granted. I'm like, huh, I can do this. And I guess seeing similar, once you lose all that weight, you will probably just feel, you know, everything yeah. else kind of comes to play. God, he knows how, you know, we're supposed to be built just even physically in our bodies and just the health we're supposed to have. And it kind of impacts everything. I love you said that. I'm curious with where you're at in life now, um, just how, how does your faith really come into play? Just even with what you do now, how does the Holy Spirit help you just with your day-to-day -day life, with what you do in your career? And, um, and even with writing this book? Holy Spirit is everything. Yes, he is. I learned when I made the transition to Nashville, because of Holy Spirit and been directed to. When I made that transition, my life completely changed. Completely changed. Everything began to open up. And everything became, not everything, but so much became clear because I was in position. I was in the proper place. And um, one of the things I learned in preparing for the transition was building my relationship with Holy Spirit. And when I got to Nashville, that tripled. And day to day, I began to learn um, and develop my relationship to him, with him, of how to hear him just on what to do. And over the last, I would say, the last few months um, since writing this book, I've even grown to another level of being able to hear him specifically on what to do, when, where, and how. In fact, this book, I was actually working on a huge book called, well, I won't tell the name of, of, of it, but I have another book and it's, it's a big book, you know, and, but I was working on that and I finished the first part and Holy Spirit interrupted me and said, I want you to stop. And I want you to write, breathe, and sing. And I want you to finish that. And I want you to execute it. Okay. I obeyed. And within 30 days, breathe and sing was done. And it was so amazing of how all the transitions have come into play in the progressions by simply listening to him and building that relationship day by day by day. So I have become very sensitive in hearing Holy Spirit. Um, I am um, find him absolutely irresistible now because it's so easy now to live life. Because to me, I don't have to figure anything out. I don't have to know the timing. I don't have to know the day. I don't have to know the what, when, where, and how. All I have to do is say, okay, what's next? What do I do? How do I do it? When do I do it? When you want me to do it, okay. And I love this because now um, this is what I say to him. Okay, I've asked you. Now I set myself upon watch and I wait to hear what it is you say to me. And then I'm just going to do it. Amen. <laughs> and that's how I live now. And it's so freeing. It's so yes. liberating. Just to hear him say, do this, execute it, and it come to pass. And to see it become a reality well right among us in the flesh that is just amazing to me 
of living life that way. And so that's where my faith has brought me. That's that's where I am in my faith now. And it's amazing. I love, I love that. I love that. <laughs> so just to rehearse for everyone, you're a mom of fabulous children and you are a pianist. Um, can you talk more about that? Like, are you, do you play for just any events or how does that, I know I have do. all your information at the end too, so people can yeah, contact yeah. you. I do. I do. I am available for, for that um, in, in the season where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> Of course, I don't do that every day, but I am a pianist. And the fact that I'm an able excellent one, to, by the way. <laughs> oh, thank you. One and the, the fact that I'm even able to see myself as a pianist, um, even though all of my years of service was on keyboards and organs the and organ. serving people. Yes. And, and, but piano has always been the instrument, you know. And um, and so, yes, I do play. Um, I'm playing um, um, recordings and I'm available for even in, in ministry groups. Uh, a few weeks ago, we went and did uh, some music ministry for the um, women's ministry, women's prison here oh, in awesome. Tennessee. Awesome. And it was absolutely amazing. The singers I played and um, gave uh, um, some word out to um, over 150 women. And we just presented worship and um, through my instrument, uh, through the singers and the word that God gave me in my mouth, released that. And it was just an explosive um, environment. And that opportunity was was absolutely great. Yeah. And you're also um, a teacher. Um, can you specify what exactly you teach and, and all of that? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, I do classroom music. Uh, but on the private end, um, my instrument is piano. And voice lessons are not the traditional voice lessons that I teach. I teach on the side of breathe and sing. And so I um, and so voices, I, I do execute voice lessons and instruct there, but it's to strengthen the singer. So a traditional voice lessons, you'll go through a traditional voice teacher for that. But you come to me to be strengthened in proper technique. You come to strengthen to be coached and to mentor in, in your um, vocals mm -hmm. and to learn the music theory that comes with it. Wow. Wow. And um, do you have anything else um, on the horizon that you'd like to share with the audience or anything else coming up? I do. The, 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 the surprising part of all of this, and I mentioned Holy Spirit, the surprising aspect that Holy Spirit revealed was the ministry aspect. Now that I did not see coming. <laughs> Um, and so the um, Compelling Love Outreach Ministries is the name of my ministry here in Nashville. And we just minister. God has given me the opportunity to minister to so many people uh, for two and a half years, day by day. The ministry opportunities are so amazing. And that's a true calling. That's my true calling. I'm beginning to see that. And Compelling Love Outreach Ministry, we've been operating for, our first meeting was in September. And every month we have been growing and developing. We're not a church. We're not a traditional church. We're not four walls. Um, but we minister to the lives of people as he brings them. And um, this month, our monthly outreach, for this month, we'll be uh, ministering to residents um, for the Christmas holidays and just taking the love of Christ, taking love to them, taking them gifts. And every month we do outreach here in Nashville. We fed the homeless. We have clothed the homeless. And, you know, so every week God has us with a, a ministry goal of outreach that we actually execute. And God just keeps bringing more people um, simply because we're not a traditional church. OK, and um, so you don't come to us to this ministry to become a member right. of a church, <laughs> right. come to to be ministered to and to give ministry as God directs. So I'm very excited about Compelling Love Ministries and what God has been doing and the miracles that has been break, um, 
broke out. Um, the miracles in people's lives every week is just it's just amazing to see him move in such on such a level in people's lives to where it just makes a difference in their lives, you know. So I'm just very amazed <laughs> at that as as well. Yeah. Wow. Well, honestly, I wish we had longer because I just think your story is so fascinating because, you know, you didn't just stick with one thing and just stay there. You're teaching and now you're doing ministry and you've written the book. And I just think you're fabulous. And I think you're really inspired people. And like I said, even if you're not a musician um, or you're not trying to get into music or anything like that, I think Miss Howard's story will inspire you in some way. Just um, I just even think even from your childhood, how you... Mm -hmm. stayed focused. I think there's so yeah. many people who have so many goals and dreams to accomplish, but they've not been able to just block out the noise and, and stay zoned in. And right. the Holy Spirit is really just, um, you know, really taking you so far and, and you listen to him and, um, and, and, and it shows. So I am so excited uh, about all that you're going to be doing. I'm so, and I'm just honored that I got to interview you. Uh, you. you guys grab her book. Um, it, it's, it's a quick read, but it's really informative. And, and um, yeah, make sure you grab the book. We'll have all of her information at the end of this episode. So, uh, and make sure you all, um, you know, click on any sites, follow her, get the book and, and just keep up with what she's doing. I am so excited again that and, and honored that I had a chance to interview Miss Janice Howard. And mm -hmm. thank you guys so much for watching this episode of Inspire with Carrie. If you would like to be on an episode of Inspire with Carrie and know someone that you, um, that you think I should interview, go ahead and contact us at the information that you'll see at the end of this episode. Again, thank you so much for watching and have a blessed one. Bye.